Good afternoon and welcome to today's conversation. We are talking about um, the stereotype of the strong black woman um, and also looking at the space or the place of vulnerability plays within the workforce. So in celebration of women in the workforce, Digify Africa presents this conversation, Women in Conversation series, a platform to investigate the currency of being a woman in the workplace and our society, a space to redefine the idea of femininity and to dismantle patriarchal and misogynistic ideals in the workspace. Through these conversations, we seek to empower and to disrupt. And in the words of Chimamande and Chingozi, I have chosen to no longer be apologetic for my femaleness and my femininity. And I want to be respected in all my femaleness because I deserve to be. Today's conversation, um, we are joined by Afiga Tjadezweni, who is the fashion and beauty editor at Women24, as well as an associate researcher and analyst and strategist at Nicola Cooper and Associates. Hi Afiga, how are you today? Hi, thank you for having us, Kagaza. It's an absolute pleasure. We also have Naledi Mashinini, who is a researcher at Africa Czech and also the, a, a, an author of the newly published book called Invisible Strings. How are you doing, Naledi? Please, could you unmute yourself? I keep getting to unmute myself. Thank you for having me here. Just on a quick point of correction, my surname is Mashishi, but uh, thank you for inviting me onto the, the webinar. Apologies for that. It is actually written Mashishi right here. Uh, um, <laughs> so that was my, my, my apology there. Well, with it being World Book Day, I'm gonna go off script slightly um, and ask Naledi just to let us know a bit about Invisible Strings and what that is about. Uh, so Invisible Strings, it's a, it's a fiction, it's technically fantasy. And it's about a little girl named Tato who starts to develop powers from a very young age. Um, she can see, find missing objects, see the dead, see visions, and she can heal people. And a pastor discovers her abilities and he makes a deal with her mother to trade, to basically pass off her powers as his own in order to grow his church. So it's about organized religion, but it's also about intergenerational trauma. Um, and yeah, that's, that's basically what it's about. Jeez, all right, sounds, sounds like an interesting one. Definitely we'll be checking that out next time we're in bookstores. Um, but I'm gonna go back to, to, to my script so that my team doesn't uh, lose it completely. Um, so the strong black woman has been standing tall for many decades. She's unbreakable, resilient, and almost superhuman. She's selfless strength personified. The Strong Black Women was initially conceived by Black women to subvert negative stereotypes. However, its popularity in the media and in popular culture has created a stereotype just as dangerous as those it intended to replace. Today, we're speaking about the stereotype. Um, and I think the, the idea of being a strong Black woman is one that we know in our lives in general, whether that be at home or in the workplace or just as we move in the world. Um, so I think that that's maybe just a good place to, to start. I figure when I say strong black women um, in, in your life, uh, whether it is sort of like your lived experience or maybe stuff that you have observed, how is that playing out in your life? What does it mean to be a strong black woman? Um, well, for me, I think what I've always observed as a strong black woman has always come with sort of, um, looking at the, the presentation of a strong black woman. I think I've never had to look back at actually what goes into the work of being a strong black woman. So it's always been this idea, this sort of like um, image that upholds is like the media we consume is like this power woman, a career woman who then goes home and she's just this great partner or great mother who's just juggling it all and she's that great friend. So I'd say maybe like a leading character perception that we've always been presented in media. So your leading characters and the likes of girlfriend, Joan, uh, or even Tony, for example, and the likes of um, Sex in the City, we're, main, we're given this main character as Carrie Bradshaw. Well, she's not black, so forget that. 
um, but just that whole leading um, woman sort of persona, um, like on being Mary Jane, she's this great news anchor, journalist, power woman who's just got it all. But I think there's a lot of um, cracks in those presentations. So I think it's something that even I'm still maneuvering, but I think at its core, I think being a strong black woman has to come with self-awareness. I think you can move so much better and smoother with self-awareness. So I think we have our different iterations of what being strong is just with the word of being strong. What is that? And I think it's such a finicky word as well. Um, so, I mean, I'm still grappling with still and learning that image that we've been presented in media for a strong black woman of being kick-ass, of being badass and sort of being romanticized for outliving your trauma to now be successful. So it's always been that thing of replacing trauma with success and that makes you so badass. It makes you so strong because you're living now, you're, I don't know, a single mother or a widow, but you're killed at work. So I think there's always been that finicky line about the strong black woman, which even myself, I, I've even said in more recent years, later in my 20s, I said, I don't want to identify as a strong black woman um, because there's so many problems with that image that we've been fed off it. Yeah, man, it's, it's tiring to say the least. Uh, but Naledi, for you, when we say strong black woman, what does that, what does that look like? I mean, funny enough for me, it's taken on more of a negative association than anything else. Like, I get that when it was conceived, it was meant to be maybe like an empowering thing. Like as black women, we can do anything. We're magic. We can raise families and kick it at work and we can do anything. But what I've kind of found is that when people perceive you as strong, they kind of lose sight of the fact that you're a person with feelings. So they kind of assume that you can take more because you're strong and you don't need as much care as other people do because you'll just pick yourself up and you don't need anyone. And that can be really harmful. I mean, I think in my life, I remember when I was, I was on, uh, when I was still at Rhodes, I was on the SRC in 2016, which was a very hectic year. There were lots of protests. And one thing that people kept saying to me was you're strong, you're strong, you're strong. So no one asked me, so like I'd be having like, I'd be falling apart emotionally and like no one would ask me if I was okay or assume anything was wrong because I'm the strong person. So I think that it can be used to, to um, be dismissive of a woman's feelings. Um, and it's in the workplace, at home, you know, people assume that you don't need the same level of support that other people do. When you actually, when meanwhile you're actually suffering. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, man, it's quite crazy. And that's really what we're hoping to unpack today, you know, and looking particularly at uh, the workplace where we spend so much of our lives. How are we seeing that also then play out in, in the workplace, whether in your own career or maybe the women around you? Have you seen women maybe taking different decisions or making different decisions or taking on a different approach to things because they're trying to uphold, you know, this, this, this image of strength? And I think particularly in, in maybe more senior roles, um, how has that affected you in the workplace? Uh, Afiga? Um, yeah, the workplace one is a big one it's the, when it comes to this particular topic, the strong black woman, because I think a lot of women, as they sort of move up in their careers, they also want to prove themselves and sort of having, I think, lived through that, that old adage of um, you have to what, work 10 times harder to get half as much as them, which would be your white counterparts, your male counterparts. Um, so I think a lot of people really do try to play up their strength and um, sort of leave their vulnerability at home when they go to work and they can't say, I'm actually uh, very tired. I have to, or I have to go home for compassionate leave and actually have to go home for longer than what is allowed. Um, you know, because a lot of women also, they are the, sort of the leaders in their home, they're, the, they're doing the black tax thing. So I think a lot of black women still struggle with that. Again, to echo and lady, I think this whole thing of putting up the strong black woman image is that it sort of doesn't allow for space for you to be vulnerable, to actually say, you know what, I'm not coping right now. And it's, it's unfair, it's an unfair, um, you know, uh, load to carry. Um, so yeah, I've seen it, especially now, I think a lot of strong black women eventually had to say, you know what, I'm starting to crumble a little during this pandemic where people were losing family members and they take that leave. But I mean, 
you have to come straight back to work and you just have to work through your grief. And I saw a lot of black women at that because especially in black families, black women are sort of the, the main people who uphold everything. Um, and as much as we like to think patriarchy is what's holding black families together, that's not the case. And so now black women are turning this line of still being a good manager and still having to look people at home and to now take on the kids if a family member has deceased and look after them for a while. And especially now in this pandemic, a lot of women, have, uh, black women have had to take on a bigger mental load. Um, and I really think there should be space for black women to be more vulnerable at work without being, without thinking they're going to be considered weak or without their um, credibility and, um, you know, merit, merit, merit being compromised without their colleagues thinking, oh, so she can't handle it now, you know, so it really is an unfair tag to have on you. And Naledi, how are you seeing it um, within your career or the career of women around you playing out? Um, oh, I've been quite lucky in the sense that my current workplace, my former workplace at Reuters have been quite supportive. But I think um, I've also, I have a background in journalism. So before I got to Africa Czech, I was working as a journalist and now my work is pretty journalism oriented. And people, you don't really see it from your bosses, but you can see, you see it a lot often in the way that people interact with journalists. Like you kind of look at the way that people would interact with uh, like something almost like I would go on the field with say like a white journalist and people and the way that people would react to that white journalist would be quite different to me. With me, it would be a bit more aggressive, a bit more sort of distrustful. Whereas with the white women, they would often have like a softer approach. So you get those. So I think that, and again, again I think that comes back to the assumption that you can handle more. Um, you don't need you don't, you're not like a soft person. You don't need to be handled the same level of care. So that's really the biggest way that I've noticed it personally. But um, yeah, like, like Afika was saying, there's also this whole thing that, you know, as a black woman, you have to work harder to sort of get the same thing that a lot of white, your whites and your male colleagues will get. And I think that also prevents women from being vulnerable. Like you kind of feel like you know, you can't really take time off if you need to, because you need to prove yourself in the workplace, which isn't fair. So, so I think you, you get, and, and also like the way that I think that people often interpret, have a tendency of interpreting black women as being more aggressive than we are. So even when we are being assertive, that assertiveness is, is interpreted as aggression. So now you have to be very, like, you have to try and like soften the way that you approach people even if you're not the one who's in the wrong. Yo, this is so much to carry. Like you need to like watch the way that you are presenting yourself. You need to be holding your family up. You need to be doing so much. This must be having an effect on our mental health, you know, as, 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 as women in the workplace. I mean, how can it not? What are the ways in which you are guarding that 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 well-being, whether physical or mental, what are the ways in which women in the workplace can really just start to 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 start taking care of ourselves, knowing that this is what we are we are we are facing? We can start with Naledi. Um. So the kind of the way that I try to guard my mental health and well-being is I, one thing I've kind of learned is to not be afraid to take leave because, like, you work for that leave. So you might as well take it. Um, and just having like a, those mini breaks can really help, especially when I start to feel overwhelmed by my work. But also, um, you know, like I've, I've kind of had to try, you kind of have to learn to build up a defense um, so that this doesn't, so this type of thing doesn't get to you, especially in my line of work where sometimes I'll publish something and it gets a lot of criticism. I had to learn to like, I had to teach myself to like not read the comments. If I get like, hateful emails from people who are unhappy with it. I kind of just have to learn to switch it off. Um, but yeah, you know, taking leave when you do have leave, venting to friends. I also have a therapist who I talk to. So all of those things help. And I figure, what, what do you feel helps um, with just guarding and protecting our well-being? 
Um, yeah, so I am, you know, I'm very big on looking after myself and spoiling myself. So even the smallest, smallest thing can really change my day. If it's been stressful, I feel like I haven't fulfilled enough in terms of my work. I'll just spoil myself at the end of the day. Netflix, treat myself to some chocolate. So the very frivolous kind of looking after yourself, but I obviously do the deeper work. I'm a spiritual person. I pray, whatever. Um, so that also calms me down. And um, I think it's also very important to have community. So I do um, reach out to friends. I, you know, just to have very casual chats or to just have sort of a lot of banter about pop culture. I consume a lot of pop culture. A lot of my references are from pop culture. Um, so to just have those like um not serious chats it really just calms me down and centers me and it reminds me there's a lot of things I find joy in um but also to add to that I've just been very very privileged to work in a space where I work with black women um like my team is just women and it's just women of color black women um so that's been also been a great privilege because I think you can also just sort of relate and you know, sort of bump self-care tips off each other or to just be empathetic towards each other. And so that's also given me the space to be comfortable to say um, every once in a while to be like, look, sorry, this is going a bit slower because I'm actually having a bad day. Like there was a day where like my car exhaust just sort of failed on me, like in the middle of my work day while running an errand. And I, just to be able to have said to my editor, my car exhaust just sort of broke down and for her to have understood and to not think it's an excuse, you know, um, to allow me for that space to still be human, to understand that outside of our work, we have other human commitments and human admin and responsibilities as a single black woman who's also just handling things herself. I think that's also been very important to have a space where you can say, I need to do this um because you know two days to do your admin versus a whole five days we are human and I think understanding that this you need to have that work-life balance you need to sort of pinch half an hour here to grab some admin and to not feel like you're cheating the system that's also been a great privilege for me um yeah yeah I mean I think definitely much the same um you spoke about the pop culture and the Netflix and I heard your uh references to girlfriends earlier. I'm also doing that for, uh, you know, just self-care, <laughs> really important there. Um, earlier, I figure also, you also spoke about, you know, the need for us to find these spaces within the workplace for us to be vulnerable, you know? And I guess my question is like, is there room for vulnerability in the workplace? Uh, should there be? Is there something that we gain from being vulnerable or is it always like a hindrance to success? Um, ooh, I would love to say in an ideal world, there should always be space for vulnerability. But I think the way the corporate system has set it up just decades long, even before our generation, it's just that work is this place where, you know, professionalism, and I think that picture of what like professionalism also looks like, it just sort of takes away from humanity, because I don't think it was actually designed for black women. I don't think it's designed for women to begin with. So I think that's also been the reason why we struggle to sort of maneuver the space of vulnerability in the workplace, because like, yeah, these corporate structures were not set up for the sort of demographic we fall under on, on that intersection of being a woman and being a black woman, especially if they weren't designed for us. Um, so I think even now with this new generation where we are sort of like, you know, championing for vulnerability, we're still working through that, but I think there should always be space, um, you know, to always be empathetic to your colleague as well. And also a lot of people were speaking about how the rules of professionalism have been sort of tossed out the window since the pandemic, you know, where you'll be on a Zoom and you see someone's kid just crop up in the screen, where that's a bit of vulnerability, getting a peek into their life, someone who's raising a child. And, you know, those moments are actually endearing sometimes, that short 10 second chuckle when a kid pops in, or when you see someone having to quickly go off camera to chase their baby, you know, those little things. And I think we've seen little peaks of them now, now that we're working from home. And I think we should have always allowed for that space initially to begin with. Um, 
yeah, we're still working through it. And yeah, also to add, since it is World Book Day, I'll sort of chime in. Yeah, there was a book that I read. It's called Nice Girls Don't Get the Corner Office. Um, it's one of those sort of like corporate self-help <laughs> um, that I mean, you have to take all of these things with a pinch of salt. Um, so yeah, I read that and it was sort of like erring on the side of saying, don't show your vulnerability. So there's also different degrees of vulnerability. So even fixing your hair or touching up your lipstick at your desk is considered a weakness because now it says you're too feminine at work. And I think that's a bit, you know, ridiculous for lack of a better word. So things like that, it shouldn't be frowned upon if I'm touching up my hair or fixing my lips. I don't want to sit at my desk with ashy lips. That should be a sort of faction of <laughs> vulnerability that's allowed and that's not frowned upon. Luckily, I'm in a more relaxed media space where that's not frowned upon, but I imagine other industries, engineering, for example, that's considered a weakness as a woman to sit at your desk and put on some lip gloss. Mm. So interesting, when you were speaking about the children coming into the Zoom session, my little one literally just opened the door and I'm just like, no, don't do it. Don't do it, not right now. <laughs> now, lady? Um, yeah, you know, like Afika said, it's, it's so hard because there are all these ideas of what is professional and what isn't professional. For example, like you could be having a really bad day and you could just want to cry at your desk, but you can't cry at your desk because it's unprofessional. So it's just about trying to find, you know, this balance. I mean, I think that what's, as, as terrible the pandemic has been, like the one sort of thing that I've noticed that's come out of it is people have kind of been a bit more, been a bit more conscious of, of mental health. So my workplace at the beginning of the pandemic told us that um, there is a therapist that we can talk to if we're struggling with the pandemic and transitioning and, and making the transition to working from home, which was really interesting. Um, you know, just that recognition that we might be struggling. Um, and that's not something that I had at, at my previous workplace. Um, you you kind of just had to show up and do your work and there was no real uh, concern about how you might be mentally doing. So, you know, in an ideal world, there would be vulnerability. You would be able to say to your boss, you know, I'm really struggling right now. But, and, and it looks like the pandemic might be pushing us more in that direction. I mean, I can't speak for other industries, but, um, but yeah, you know, unfortunately that's not a choice that a lot of women have at work. Yeah, it really has been interesting to see how companies are responding um, to, to the pandemic. And I think responding as well to that whole thing of now, like my work life and my home life are all in one space and they'll overlap, you know? Um, I guess maybe that is the challenge for, for those of us who are uh, creating workspaces. And that's actually our last question, but we'll get to that shortly. I've just got a comment coming through from our uh, Facebook coming through from Lula Kamosi saying, vulnerability is necessary for empathy to take place. And in the workplace, um, for empathy to take place in the workplace, although it should never be used as a weapon to manipulate employees either. It goes both ways and I completely agree. Um, and now I think talking about the workplaces, talking about creating safe workplaces for, for, for women, what does that look like for you? You know, I think for a company like Digify Africa, we really pride ourselves in being black women led, you know, so we're always challenging ourselves to think what kind of work environment do we need to create, you know, to be able to, to harness that and to be able to really take advantage of, of, of what women bring to the workplace. Um, so if I was to ask you, um, Naledi, about, you know, creating healthy and safe for working place, working environments for, for black women, what do those pillars um, that hold that up um, look like? Um, yeah, I think that, a, you know, recognition of people's mental health would be a big part of it. Um, even if the boss, even if, you know, there's some kind of therapy session with the boss to say, you know, if you need anything, I'm here. Just some kind of recognition, especially now that we're going through a pandemic and so many people have lost so much. So many people are dealing with death in the family. So I think it's really important now for workplaces to be like, listen, we understand that you're going through a tough time. And if you need someone to talk to, then, you know, we're here. Um, for me, that would be like the biggest sort of pillar, right? Because so many of the issues 
that we have related to the workplace are related to the fact that you don't really feel like you have anyone to speak to. But even just, I mean, other things like, you know, recognizing that there are people who have kids. So you can't assume that, um, you can't ask someone last minute, can you work late tonight? You need to try and ask them in advance in case, if they have kids so they can make plans for their kids. You know, recognizing that there are people who have periods. So <laughs> if someone comes in with like debilitating period pain, then that's something that, you know, it's not unprofessional for them to not be able to work their best when they're going through that. Like and just making those kind of, just understanding those kinds of things. Yeah, and it's actually, I'm reflecting now on my work environment. So now I'm at Digify Africa and there's black women everywhere and there's conversations we can have. There's just understanding that we, that, that we have, you know, but reflecting on previous workspaces that weren't like that. It's so crazy how little things like that like make such a huge difference in, in, in how we work. Um, Afiga, for you, uh, what do you think companies like Digify Africa should be striving for if we are saying that we are creating healthy and safe working environment for Black women? Um, yeah, so I'm pretty much the uh, same breath as Naledi, um, where I think mental health should also be accounted for, and my company as well, since the pandemic, we've been more um, vocal and transparent about the fact there is mental health facilities available for employees. It was always there, but I think it was further highlighted during um, Black Lives Matter and during the pandemic. Um, so I think really understanding that various people have various mental health concerns. And um, yeah, again, also with um, understanding people have like very um, debilitating period pains like dysmenorrhea and to have space to be have a period day off. You know, um, I'll always think of the time where just going back to the fact that strong black women are, you know, perceived to be able to handle it better. Um, when I was also still back at Rhodes, I uh, couldn't attend the tut because I had very bad period pains. Then when I went back onto campus the next day, I went to the department receptionist and I said, I was sick, I have very bad period pains. This always happens to me. I don't go to a doctor because I just handle it at home. So I'm saying she's like, you don't have a doctor's note. She was like, I'm not giving you your leave of absence. You're just not getting it and you can't get a makeup touch for it. And it was a white woman. And when another sort of girl I was friendly with in the same class, she took a day off. She missed the touch because she had broken up with a boyfriend and she was granted the leave of absence. She didn't see a doctor. So I was like, okay, so white girls are allowed to be vulnerable. Black women aren't. I was actually physically ill. Um, so I think it's also that. So, and it's like also just that empathy that is a neutral sense of empathy for everyone, not thinking she can handle it better, that sort of thing. Um, yeah. Um, oh, lost my other thought. But yes, I think that lady said just allowing <laughs> um, for space where we can talk about mental health to empathize and to. Also, just when new black women come in, um, just try as much as you can to be an ally. You guys don't have to have a lot in common. You guys don't have to hang out after work. But I think it's very important when black women come into a new workplace to feel like they have an ally, especially when the place isn't predominantly black, like the likes of my company or Digify, where you are the minority as a black woman in your workspace. I think it's important to sort of be an ally, especially when the new woman is younger, to just sort of say, I got you, rather than feeling threatened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I actually also reflect back on, on, on my time at um, City Press because I also started as a, as a journalist and I look really fondly at um, one of the senior journalists who really took me under her wing as well and there's so much about, you know, the working environment that I learned from her directly and from her doing that. So thanks for that and thank you for joining us uh, this afternoon. I really do hope that workplaces are challenged um, in thinking about the ways that we can make the working environment a lot safer um, for, for, for women, you know, um, and really just acknowledging everything that we are having to go through. And I really also then do hope that we, as well as women, are challenged in taking the opportunity to be vulnerable and to show vulnerability. And I think as well, um, yeah, those of us who have been working longer to, to allow younger staff members to, to be able to do that. Uh, thank you, Afiga, and thank you, uh, Naledi, for joining us. Thank you to everyone as well who has joined us um, on, on our Facebook Live with Digify Africa. 
Um, if you caught the conversation halfway, you definitely can go through to the beginning um, and check it out. Thank you so much and have a good afternoon. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much.